It is day 99 of reading and studying through the Bible in 365. I'm Kanoi. Welcome to Bible study. I am so excited that you guys are here today. We are reading through 1 Samuel chapters 4 through 8. But before we get started, if this Bible study has blessed your life, if you love the Lord, if you are passionate about His Word, if you could like the video because that will help to get other people passionate for the Word of God as well. And also make sure you're subscribed to the channel, hit the notification bell so you always have first access to exclusive content and make sure you're connected with us in our Facebook group. Everything else you need in the description box below. But before we get started, let's pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. You are holy, you are mighty, you are awesome. You are our everlasting Father. We love you so much. Your kingdom come and your will be done, not ours, but everything that is good and perfect according to you, here on earth as it is in heaven. Please give us this day our daily bread as we get into your word, as we read it diligently, as we seek you. I pray that you'll meet us where we're at, that your spirit will make the word come to life. I pray for revelation. I pray for the rhema, Lord, as we read the logos today. And forgive us of our sins. If there's anything that is hindering us from hearing from you, I pray that you remove it now. Bring it to light. Help us to see it, Lord, to confess, to repent, and help us also to forgive those who have hurt us and who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, Lord, but please deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 4, we see that the Israelites are once again up against the Philistines. And if we look at a reminder of who the Philistines are, they're strong and seafaring peoples from Crete originally, settled in the coastal areas. They have set up five cities and they are dominating that coastal area. They're proficient in smelting iron and therefore they have chariots and they've got weaponry that is far more advanced than anything that Israel has. And they are always at war with Israel as we see here in chapter four. And the word of Samuel came to all of Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. They encamped at Ebenezer, which means stone of help. And if you remember that 20 years earlier, they had a victory here at Ebenezer in chapter seven. And the Philistines encamped at Aphek. Aphek is about 13 miles northeast of Joppa, which is uh, the northern Philistine border. The Philistines drew up in line against Israel, and when the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men. So the Philistines have killed 4,000 Israelites on the field of battle, which makes sense because remember, they've got those chariots, which is working towards their advantage. Verse 3, and when the people came to the camp, the elders of Israel, meaning the family heads or those who lead the people of Israel in politics and war because they don't have a king right now. So the elders are the one who do that. So they said, why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? See, they're not used to getting defeated because the Lord has always been with them this whole time. Let us bring the Ark of Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, that it may come from among us and save us from the power of the enemies. Now, if you remember, the Ark of the Covenant was to remain inside the Holy of Holies. No one was to look at it. No one was to see it, except for the high priest who would go in once a year to make atonement for the sins of all of Israel. And here they're wanting to take it out of the tabernacle, to bring it to them into war as like a good luck charm. But the thing is, is if they had only realized that it is not the Ark of the Covenant itself, it's not the box itself, but the presence of God, which they had access to at any time that was with them if they would just simply repent and call upon him. But instead, they're trying to bring the box with them in hopes that the Spirit of God will be upon them and bring them victory. Verse 4, so the people sent Shiloh to Shiloh and brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, remember these are wicked priests, were there with the Ark of the Covenant. Verse 5, as soon as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all of Israel gave a mighty shout, yes, he's here, the Lord is with us. At least that's what they're thinking, right? They have this false sense of security that's not grounded in truth right now. So all the earth resounded. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shouting, they said, what does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And when they learned that the Ark of the Lord had come to the camp, the Philistines were actually afraid. And they said, a God has come into the camp. Notice that they don't say the God, but a God has come. So the Israelites here are more amped up 
by hype than truth or the word of God. They are more concerned about the symbol itself than the substance that is within the Ark of the Covenant. And they actually think that they're better than the pagans at this point. But sadly, they're acting just like them. And they continue here, the Philistines, woe to us for nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods. Notice that it's plural. So they don't think that it is God almighty. They think that there are more than one mighty God here. These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. So clearly they have heard about what God has done for them. They just don't realize the source. Take courage and be men, O Philistines, lest you become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines here are taking up courage. They know that God is greater, even though they are proclaiming that God is God. They think it's many gods. But they also are not submitting to these many gods. They're like, you know what? We're going to come up stronger and we're going to fight even harder. If we're going to take any lesson from the Philistines, any good thing from them, it's this, that they are courageous and that they persist through the hard times. And this is going to show that they will gain victory because of it. Verse 10, so the Philistines fought and Israel was defeated once again and they fled every man to his home. And there was a great slaughter, a very great slaughter, 30,000 this time, a greater defeat. This is seven times what we saw before. Foot soldiers of Israel fell and the ark of God was captured and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas also died. So this is going to be a huge tragedy for Israel. The fact that the ark of God was captured, this is not only going to defeat them uh, spiritually, but morally in every way. And the presence of God is not with them. But again, it isn't because of the ark. It is because they have turned their back on God. That is the reason why the glory of God has departed from them. And here we see the fact that Hophni and Phinehas died as prophesied. This is the first step in the judgment against the house of Eli. Verse 12. A man of Benjamin ran from the battle line and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes torn and with dirt on his head. So this man, clearly in mourning here, this is a sign of mourning. Some Jewish uh, rabbis believe that this was Saul. And this is a big journey. He's going 20 miles uphill. And for him to have done that in the same day on foot, probably, that is huge. When he arrived, Eli was sitting on his seat. So he's in within the city gate by the road watching for his heart trembled for the ark of God. So notice that he's not sad about his sons, well, maybe he is, but he's more concerned about the ark of God and not his sons dying. And when the man came into the city and told the news, all the city cried out. When Eli heard the sound of the outcry, he said, what is this uproar? Then the man hurried and came and told Eli. Now, Eli was 98 years old and his eyes were set so that he could not see. And the man said to Eli, I am he who has come from the battle. I fled from the battle today. And he said, how did it go, my son? He who brought the news answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines. And there's also been a great defeat among the people. Your two sons, also Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. And the ark of the God has been captured. As soon as he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell over backward from his seat by the side of the gate. And his neck was broken and he died. For the man was old and heavy. He had judged Israel for 40 years. So here we are seeing the second step in the judgment against the house of Eli. Not only did his sons die, but he died also on the same day, even though it wasn't prophesied that he would die on the same day, he did. So why did Israel end up losing? One, it's because the Philistines had great courage of desperate men and they were persistent. Two, because the Israelites didn't try very hard. They assumed that God was with them just because of the ark. And three, it was because that God did not bless their superstitious belief in the ark of God. You know, sometimes we can read the Bible and say, how could they honestly think that? What was their problem? It's really easy for us on the outside to look at them and think that they were crazy in all of their ways. But the thing is, is we still do these kinds of things today. Sometimes we'll think that because we're doing our daily devotions, because we're in the word, because we're praying, because we're going to church, we're doing all the things right. We think that our life is going to go smooth sailing and then something crashes down upon us and we're like, where are you, God? 
But God never promised an easy life. In fact, quite the opposite. When we become Christians, those trials and those persecutions actually seem to come a little bit harder upon us. But the difference is, is now we have the presence of the Lord with us. We know how to deal with these circumstances because we have the truth of the word. Every single thing in life can be dealt with with the word of God. Now on the flip side of that, we sit here and think, how could they have made the ark of God an idol? But let's just talk here a little bit about Bible journaling in itself. Some people think that we can't touch our Bible. You can't write in your Bible. You can't color in your Bible. It's wrong. It's sinful. You're destroying the Word of God. But hello, the paper, the ink, isn't the Word of God. The Word of God is alive and active. This is simply a vehicle through which the Word of God comes. Now, it doesn't mean that we treat this with irreverence and that we don't respect it. Of course we do. But if you want to take notes in this book, if you want to write in it and it helps you become deeper in your knowledge and it helps you in your relationship to grow, to know Christ more, I honestly do not think that God is sitting up there seething as you highlight verses and write down notes. In fact, I think he is saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. But there are some people who treat this like the Israelites treated the Ark of the Covenant. And they were more concerned with the symbol of what this meant as opposed to the substance that is within it. So anytime we treat anything as more important than God or as holy as God, that is something that is wonderful and good that becomes an idol. Worship can become an idol. Pastors can become idols. I know people who feel like they are gonna have good favor because they're in the presence of pastors. So it's just something to think about and something to keep at the forefront of our minds, that it isn't about the things, but it's about the true presence and truth and wonder of God. So to answer the question of the Israelites of why is this happening to us? Well, let me answer you now. You only wish we could be there with them to say, hey, this is the righteous judgment of God on the nation of Israel, but also on the house of Eli. And this is also a corrective hand of God that is coming here to hopefully get you to finally turn yourselves around, come back in repentance and with a humble heart to serve and honor God alone. Verse 19, now his daughter-in-law, the wife of Phineas, was pregnant, about to give birth. And when she heard the news of the ark of God being captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed and gave birth, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women attending her said to her, do not be afraid, for you have borne a son. So this sounds a lot like the story of Rachel, when she too died during childbirth. But she did not answer or pay attention, and she named the child Shabbat, saying, The glory has departed from Israel because the ark of God had been captured and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. So again, Shabbat, remembering that is the glory of God. Of course, I Shabbat now being no glory or the glory has departed. So her grief here is far greater than her maternal joy that most mothers will feel after giving birth. And rightfully so. I mean, this isn't something that we can judge her on. She's just lost her father-in-law. She's lost her husband. She sees that the Ark of God is uh, captured. So she seems to be a faithful woman. But don't worry. I wish we could tell her here and comfort her in this time of her last day of saying, God is faithful. His glory will return. Chapter 5, when the Philistines captured the Ark of God, they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. So Ashdod is about three miles inland, uh, 22 miles south of Joppa, and it's one of the five Philistine cities. Then the Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up besides Dagon. So Dagon is like their chief god. He is the god of weather, of fertility. He's half man, he's half fish, and he is known to be the father of Baal. And when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward. So, hey, God's glory is indeed here. Nothing is going to stop it. God will glorify himself. The rocks will cry out if the people don't, right? So here we see that their God has fallen face downward, almost in the sense that this God is having to worship God Almighty before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and put him back in his place. But when they rose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord again, and the head of Dagon and both his hands were lying cut off 
on the threshold. So they were once confident when they captured the Ark of God, the Philistines are like, you know what? We're Dagon did this for us. We're going to set this thing right next to Dagon. Dagon is going to be uh, worshipped by their God. But look what is happening here. Quite the opposite to the point that his head gets cut off and so do his hands. So this is a foolish God, right? Falls prostrate, worshiping God. Verse six, the hand of the Lord was heavy against the people of Ashdod and he terrified and afflicted them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. And when the man of Ashdod saw how things were, they said, the ark of God of Israel must not remain with us for his hand is hard against us and against Dagon, our God. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines, which were the rulers of the five cities. And they said, what shall we do with this ark of the God of Israel? So clearly God is trying to get their attention here. If they're not going to listen to him the first time when he makes Dagon fall down, not only once, but twice, God is going to speak again and he's going to speak a little bit louder. And just like us, they're probably not going to like the second voice of God, which in this case is hemorrhoids. So sadly, I mean, they really could have turned around and actually started serving God or, you know, honoring him. But instead, they're like, we got to get rid of this dude. So they answered, let the ark of the God of Israel be brought around to Gath. So I don't know what their relationship is with Gath. I mean, clearly, this is one of their cities, but it's like, are they wanting to get rid of him to, I don't know, bring affliction upon those people? Like as a, here, you all take him. Or are they simply just hands off wanting somebody else to take him? Well, they brought the ark of God to Israel there, of Israel there. But after they had brought it around, the hand of the Lord was against the city, causing a very great panic. And he afflicted the men of the city, both young and old, so that tumors broke out on them as well. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron, which is six miles north of Gath. So you can see they're like playing hot potato here. But as soon as the ark of God came to Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, they've brought around to us the ark of the God of Israel to kill us and our people. They sent therefore and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it return to its own place that it may not kill us and our people. For there was a deathly panic through the whole city. The hand of God was so heavy there. The men who did not die were struck with tumors and the cry of the city. Sadly, what could have been a blessing to the Philistines ends up almost being a curse upon them. I mean, if you think about it, they have the presence of God, of Yahweh, the glory in their place of worship. But a lesson that we can take from this here is what is your Dagon? What in your life do you have that is ruling over you? Is there any type of addiction or sin or something that you keep returning to that you're having a hard time getting rid of, that you're trying so hard to resist, but it just seems to have a hold on you? Well, sometimes it might be because you're trying to do it on your own strength. You are physically trying to resist that sin, that addiction, that thing that has a hold on you. But a lot of the times God is simply saying, turn the light on. All you need to do is bring in the presence of God, get in my word, pray, get to church, surround yourselves with people who can hold you accountable. When you bring in the ark of God, when you bring in the presence of God, you're simply turning on the light on the darkness and then Dagon will have no choice but to fall because light and dark are mutually exclusive. And the thing is, is that light always wins. Chapter six, so what was once a trophy to the Philistines has now become a burden and they are like, please get rid of this. So the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines for seven months and the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners. Remember the diviners are people who claim to predict the future and they would do so by ways of like watching flight patterns of birds, looking at livers that were sacrificed on animals. And so... I don't know that I would put my trust in diviners, but they did. So they called them and they said, what shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us with what we shall send it to its place. They said, if you send away the ark of God of Israel, do not send it empty, but by all means return him a guilt offering. Then you will be healed and it will be known to you why his hand does not turn away from you. And they said, what is the guilt offering that we shall return to him? And they answered, five golden tumors and five golden mice, according to your uh, number of the lords of the Philistines, for the same plague was on all of you and on your lords. 
Verse 5, so you must make images of your tumors and images of your mice that ravage the land and give glory to the God of Israel. Interesting here that the Philistines were calling this presence many gods. And the diviners here say the God of Israel. They know who it is. They are acknowledging him because this is an internationally known God. But guess what? Of course, they still don't worship him, but they know who he is. So let's just remember here that the devil himself knows the name of Jesus. People who are not of God can claim to be of God. They will use the name of God. I mean, we've got people who comment here on this channel speaking the language you know, saying in Jesus name while trying to scam people, which by the way, just be careful of that. <laughs> the enemy loves to disguise himself as an angel of light. So he says, perhaps he will lighten his hand from you and your gods and your land. Why should you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? So again, they know what happened in the past. After he had dealt severely with them, did they not send the people away and they departed? Now then take and prepare a new cart and two milk cows on which there has never come a yoke and yoke the cows to the cart, but take their calves home away from them. So separate mom and babies, these mothers who have never carried yoke before and take the ark of the Lord and place it on the cart, which wrong, you're not supposed to place it on a cart it is to be carried by poles, but they don't know any better. And put in a box at its side the figures of gold, which you are returning to him as a guilt offering. Then send it off and let it go its way and watch. If it goes up the way to its own land, to Beth Shemesh, then it is he who has done us this great harm. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that struck us. It happened to us by coincidence. Now the odds here are stacked against God. They are separating a mother from her babies. And it would be the natural inclination of that mother to turn around and go back home to be with her calves. And so they're saying, if that doesn't happen, then we absolutely know that this was God because there's no way that these mothers would leave their babies behind. But if the mothers do in fact turn around and come back home, then we know this was simply coincidence. But the thing is, is we know that nothing is coincidence. Nothing happens by chance. It is either going to be the hand of God that does something, or it is going to be a consequence of an action that had taken place. So some people would say, well, then God actually isn't in control then, because if he controlled everything, that would mean that we actually don't have free will. No, we do. We have free will, but yet he is still in control over his purpose, his plan, and his will. So no matter what kind of decisions we make over here that causes this to happen over here, God is still going to fulfill his purpose in whatever way that he sees fit. So just because things happen doesn't necessarily mean that, oh, this is divine from God. It could very well be a consequence of an action that took place earlier. All right, so what happened? Verse 10, the men did this and took two milk cows and yoked them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. And they put the ark of the Lord on the cart and the box with the golden mice, the images of their tumors. And the cows went straight in the direction of Beth Shemesh along one highway, lowing as they went. And I said, this is so sad because you know that they're crying for their babies, yet they're fulfilling the purpose of God. They just beelined it. They didn't even detour. They didn't go to the right or the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them as far as the border of Beth Shemesh. So they are going straight towards the purpose of God. Again, God, in this case, being in control. Now, Beth Shemesh means... Uh, house of the Sun. It's a Levitical city near the border, which is about eight miles east of Ekron. Uh, house of the Sun in Hawaii is Haleakala. If anybody knows that, just a little, uh, <laughs> a little fun fact on Maui. Beautiful place to watch the sunrise. Squirrel. Okay, verse 13. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. So this means it's sometime in the spring because they plant their wheat in the fall, now reaping it. And when they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark, they rejoiced to see it. The cart came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and stopped there. A great stone was there, and they split up the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. So this was a place of worship here, this great stone. And the Levites took down the Ark of the Lord and the box that was beside it. So clearly they know how to deal with the Ark of God. 
and which were the golden figures, and set them upon the great stone. And the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrifice off, uh, sacrifices on that day to the Lord. And this is rightfully being done because this is a priestly city. And when the five lords of the Philistines saw it, they returned that day to Ekron. So these five lords, they must have been in awe. I can only imagine they must have been like, what in the world is happening? The cows themselves are showing God's glory where Israel didn't, where the Philistines refused to allow it to happen. The cows did it. Verse 17, these are the golden tumors that the Philistines returned as a guilt offering to the Lord. One for Ashdod, one for Geza, one for Ashkelon, one for Gath, one for Ekron, and the golden mice, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines belonging to the five lords, both fortified cities and unwalled villages. The great stone beside which they set down the ark of the Lord is a witness to this day in the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. Verse 19, and he struck some of the men of Beth Shemesh. What? Because they looked upon the ark of the Lord. Ah, okay. So basically they had a lack of reverence for the holy things of God, which that's still in place. That commandment that the Lord had given them still is in place. And maybe, I don't know if they didn't know how to act. I don't know if that they were just so disobedient in their nature anyway. And so laissez-faire with the way that they treated God, that they just... I don't know, compromise here. He struck 70 men of them and the people mourned because the Lord had struck the people with a great blow. Then the men of Beth Shemesh said, who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? So they're like, "Uh uh-oh, where next? And to whom shall he go up away from us? So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kiriath-Jerim saying, the Philistines have returned the Ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up to you. So here we see the Israelites acting just like the Philistines. We don't want this Ark of the Lord here because he is way too harsh for us. It isn't a harsh act on behalf of God that is happening here. It was a deserved judgment on the way that they were treating him with irreverence, that they were not treating him with the holiness and the awe that he commanded and deserved. So what do they do? They call up their neighbors. Hey guys, guess what? The Ark of the Lord is back. Why don't you all come get him? And they probably made up some story and were like, hey, you know what? Y'all really deserve to have it in your area. You guys should really come and get it. Because the truth of the matter is, is that they probably just want to go back to the way that they were living before in compromise and in sin. And they didn't want the presence of God to be hovering over them because that would mean that they would have to make a change. Chapter seven, and the men of Kiriath-Jerim came and took up the ark of the Lord and brought it to the house of Abinadab on the hill. And they consecrated his son, Eliezer, which means God is help or God is power to have charge of the Ark of the Lord. Now, we don't know if his son Eliezer is part of the priestly lineage, but nevertheless, he did this and it is what it is. If anybody has info on that, let me know in the comments. Verse two, from the day that the Ark was lodged at Kiriath-Jerim, a long time passed, some 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. So they treated the Ark a little bit differently than the previous guys did. They actually treated it with respect, but they didn't take it to Shiloh where it belonged at the tabernacle. Verse three, and Samuel said to all the house of Israel, if you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the people of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtaroth and they serve the Lord only. Well, hallelujah. We see some hope here. Samuel being that spiritual deliverer, the good judge of Israel. He is calling them to repentance, not only inwardly in their heart, but outwardly as well with an expression of their loyalty to God by putting away the foreign gods. Now, Ashtaroth was the goddess of fertility, of sexuality, and of war. So there was likely a lot of prostitution going on in this area. And thank God they decide to repent and put away the gods and clean up their act. Verse five, then Samuel said, gather all Israel at Mizpah, Mizpah being eight miles north of Jerusalem. And this will become the capital after the fall of Jerusalem. It's This is the same place where Jacob was separated from Laban in Genesis 31. It's the same place that was the gathering place for Israel in Judges chapter 20. 
So they gather here. It's known as a gathering place and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. This sounds very much like what David says later on. So this pouring out before the Lord of the water, because water was a commodity then that was highly prized, wasn't a lot of it. And this was a symbol of them emptying themselves before the Lord. It's, it was a symbolic repentance and conviction is nothing. I mean, if you're convicted of your sin, if you don't do something about it, it means nothing. So this is their symbolism of emptying themselves of themselves and being filled with the spirit of God. And the fact that they fasted, this is another outward expression saying that nothing else matters but God. We are going to put off all things, everything that we think we need on this earth. We are going to put it to the side and honor our God only. And Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mizpah. So this is showing that he had a position as the chief magistrate, and he basically was the wisdom giver. He gave wisdom to them. Now, when the Philistines heard that the people of Israel had gathered at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. So they're sitting here looking at these Israelites worshiping their God, putting away the other gods that the Philistines know to be the ones of power. And they're like, look at these little weaklings over here. Let's go up against them. And the people of Israel said to Samuel, do not cease to cry out to the Lord, our God for us. So now they know what it's going to take, that we need to be people of prayer, to cry out to God, to help us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. So they are not uh, relying on this magic of the ark, they are relying on the power of God. So Samuel took a nursing lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel. So we can see here he's a mediator. And the Lord answered him. And Samuel was offering up the burnt offering. The Philistines drew near to attack Israel. But the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion. And they were defeated before Israel. This is awesome. And the men of Israel went out from Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them as far as below Beth Car. So if only they had done this before, if only they had cried out to the Lord, repented, put away their idols, they could have had victory all along. Now, this attack was so powerful that the Philistines honestly didn't come against Israel um, during the entire judgeship of Samuel. So this was something that was so significant. In this time, verse 12, then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen and called its name Ebenezer. For he said, till now, the Lord has helped us, giving full credit and glory and honor to God. So the Philistines were subdued and did not again enter the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. The cities that the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Ekron to Gath, and Israel delivered their territory from the hand of the Philistines. There was peace also between Israel and the Amorites. And I know I've said it before, but one of my Ebenezer stones is, is my journaling. It's my Bible. I mean, this is all things that remind me of where I've been, my prayers that I write down. That is, in a sense, an Ebenezer stone because it points you back to God and what he has done and how he's been faithful. Chapter eight, when Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. Okay, wait, what? I don't know if he had this authority because we know that God has been the one to always appoint judges. But again, nevertheless, Samuel did it. So this may have been one of his downfalls here. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, which means the Lord is God. And the name of his second, Abijah, which means my father is Lord. They were judges in Beersheba, which is the town that is south. Remember from Dan to Beersheba, from north to south? Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and they perverted justice. This always makes me so sad when we have such an awesome dude and then he has kids and they're horrible. <laughs> but okay. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. Uh-oh. Now they're wanting to be like all the nations, even though God has called them to be different from everybody. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So what does Samuel do? He does the right thing. 
he goes to pray to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, so we're going to see a little bit of a downfall here with God's answer. Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you. <laughs> so this is showing the fact that God is answering him this way, that Samuel came in prayer because he was worried and upset that the people were rejecting his leadership. But God is saying, they're not rejecting you. It's not about you, Sam, but they've rejected me from being a king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are also doing to you. So don't worry about it. They're treating you just like they're treating me. Now then obey their voice. Go ahead. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So I asked, what are the reasons that Israel wanted a king so bad? Well, it could be one that because they saw their future under the leadership of Samuel's sons as not something so bright. They had just endured years and years of being under evil judges and they saw where that took them, which was nowhere good. But it's the second reason that is really the one that is detestable in the eyes of the Lord. It wasn't the fact that they wanted a king that was bad. I mean, even God himself made provisions for a king to be over Israel. But the thing is, is that it wasn't in his timing. They're wanting a king now and they're demanding it because they want to be like other nations. So because they are not willing to wait on God, he's going to give them the very thing that they ask for. So Samuel warns them, he says, uh, with all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for the king, these will now be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. So he's basically telling them there's going to be a military draft. Verse 12, and he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipments of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. So too, there's going to be slavery. He is going to take and appoint the sons and the daughters. He will take the best of your fields and your vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. So there's going to be taxation and again, slavery. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day, you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves instead of allowing God to appoint one for you. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. So all of their personal freedom is going to be taken away. And God is no longer going to speak when they cry out to him. So notice that these God, these kings are going to be takers Whereas God, on the other hand, who should have been their one and only king, is a giver. Anytime we're in distress and in need of help, he gives. He gave his son to us when we were desperately in need. Verse 19, but the people refused to obey. After all that, they still refused to obey the voice of Samuel. Huh. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we may also be like, that we also may be like all the nations. And that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. So they are depending on this king, sort of like an idol, to do everything for them. Like he's going to be this little token for them. And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. Once again, being that mediator. But thank God he goes to the Lord again. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey their voice and make them a king. So Samuel then said to the men of Israel, Go every man to his city. Ah, this is so heartbreaking. But of course we know that it is just God showing us how to be better, showing us examples of what not to do and how to live our lives in the way that he intended for it to be lived out. And you know, last night before we went to bed, we were saying our prayers with my children and my son who's 12 years old who wants so badly to go to this specific private school. It's all he talks about. It's all he's working towards. And he said last night in his prayers, Lord, please let me go to this school, but let your will be done. And I could have just cried a river of tears to know that he gets it, that he knows that the will of God for his life is so much better than anything that he could ever selfishly want. 
And I thought to myself, this is a 12 year old who gets it. How do we not get it so much of the time where we just think that our desires are so much more important that we will forego the good and perfect will of God. And this was something that I feel the Lord has really worked on my heart in the past couple of years. Lord, your will be done. If we don't say any other prayer but this one, I think we will get it right. Your will be done, Lord. We wake up in the morning, Lord, your will be done today. We go to bed at night, Lord, your will be done. When we speak that out, our hearts will follow. This is why I love saying the Lord's Prayer, the way that Jesus taught us to pray, because at the end of it all, He always comes back to that, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. If it is your will, let this cup be taken from me. That was the heart of Jesus, and that should be our hearts today. And when it is, it will save us from years of bad decisions and consequences that might come from the things that we decided to do and to take upon ourselves. So we thank you, Lord, for this word today. Thank you so much for being such a faithful God. Lord, we are here in this time for a purpose. You have chosen each and every one of us. You have chosen our children to live in the generations that we are in. So I thank you for that, Lord, and for allowing us to read your word, to read the history, to understand that the same mistakes that we are making today were made thousands of years ago. But Lord, we can save ourselves from so much heartache if we will just understand the truth, to know it and to apply it to our lives. So I just pray, Lord, that whatever our desires are, God, that we will seek you first in all things. I pray that we will delight ourselves in you, for we know, Lord, that when we do that, then you will give us all the things that we want and need, that our desires will come into line with you. So Lord, we're going to speak that today. Your will be done. Have your way with our hearts, Lord. Mold us into the people that you want us to be. We love you so much, and we thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Heaven is a divine gift to us that is given by grace. We're not going to get it because we are indeed righteous. We are getting it because God loves us. But again, we will not receive that promised land. We will not receive that gift of eternal life if we don't receive Jesus. So I want to give someone that opportunity today who is saying, I've never done that. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to go after I die, but I see now that that is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer. I'm going to put the words on the screen so you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and when you confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord, that he died and he rose again, then you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I thank you that all of my sins are forgiven. I confess of my sin, I turn from them and I live my life for you. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.